Hey guys, today we're going to talk about Otto Warm Beer. Hey guys, Victoria Baxton here. Thanks for stopping back by my YouTube channel. Okay, so we're going to talk about Otto Warm Beer, okay? Like, share, subscribe, all that stuff, it's free. If you're a real psychic, then I know you've already done a reading. If you're fake, I don't want you on my channel. Bye bye, see ya. Okay, let's get started, you guys. This is going to be a long one, okay? Otto Frederick Warmbier was born on December 12th of 1994 in Cincinnati, Ohio, to Cindy and Fred Warmbier. Otto was the eldest of three children. He attended Wyoming High School, where he was considered studious and popular, and graduated in 2013 as salutatorian. Way to go. After that, he enrolled at the University of Virginia, where he was pursuing a double major in commerce and economics and did a foreign exchange at the London School of Economics. His minor was in global sustainability. Warmbier, who was Jewish through his mother, was active in Hillel on his college campus. I hope I didn't butcher that, I'm sorry. He was a member of the Theta Chi fraternity. Otto was scheduled to undertake a study abroad program in Hong Kong in early 2016 and decided to visit North Korea. En route over the, sorry. <laughs> Let me back up. Otto was scheduled to undertake a study abroad program in Hong Kong in early 2016 and decided to visit North Korea en route over the New Year's period. He booked a tour of North Korea with Young Pioneer Tours, a budget tour operator based in China founded by two Westerners whose slogan was, destinations your mother would rather you stay away from. Warmbier's father, Fred, said that the Young Pioneer program advertised the trip as safe for U.S. citizens and that Otto was curious about their culture and he wanted to meet the people of North Korea. On December 29th, 2015, Otto flew via Beijing to North Korea with his tour group, which included 10 other U.S. citizens, for a five-day New Year's tour. The group, I'm sorry, the tour group celebrated New Year's Eve by carousing in Pyongyang Kim II Sung Square before returning to the Yang. Gado International Hotel, where some continued drinking alcohol. According to his trial, Warmbier tried to steal a propaganda poster from a, from a staff-only area of the hotel at around 2 a.m. on New Year's Day. On January 2, 2016, Warmbier was arrested at the International Airport while awaiting departure from North Korea. Danny Grattan, a British member of Warmbier's tour group, witnessed the arrest. Grattan said no words were spoken. Two guards just came over and simply tapped Otto on the shoulder and led him away. I just said kind of nervous, nervously, quote, well, that's last time we'll see you, close quote. Wow. There's a great irony in these words. That was it. That was the last physical time I saw Otto ever. Otto didn't resist. He didn't look scared. He sort of half smiled. When the group's plane was about to leave the terminal, an official came on board and announced Otto is very sick and has been taken to the hospital. Some media reports indicated that Warmbier spoke by phone to a young Pioneer tour guide following his arrest, but this was denied by a spokesman from Young Pioneer who told the BBC News that none of its employees had direct contact with Otto after he was escorted away. The others in his tour group left the country without incident. North Korea's state-run Korean Central News Agency, KCNA, initially announced that Warmbier had been detained for a hostile act against the state without specifying further details. North Korea refused to elaborate on the precise nature of his wrongdoing for six weeks. Although a young pioneer spokeswoman advised Reuters there had been an incident at the Yangako Hotel. In a press conference on February 29th of 2016, Warmbier, reading from a prepared statement, confessed that he had attempted to steal a propaganda poster from a restricted staff-only area of the second floor of the Yangako Hotel to take home. The poster said in Korean, let's arm ourselves strongly with Kim Jong the Second's patriotism. Damaging or stealing such items with the name or image of a North Korean leader is considered a serious crime by the North Korean government. It is not known whether the confession was forced as Warmbier never regained consciousness after his return to the U.S. However, various observers said that he was clearly under duress. 
Former prisoners of North Korea have later recanted their confessions after their release, stating that they were made under duress. Warmbier's confession also stated that he had plotted to steal the poster at the behest of a Methodist church in his hometown and the Z Society, a secret society at the University of Virginia that he wished to join, both of which he said were allied with the Central Intelligence Agency. Wasn't he Jewish? And what the hell does the CIA have to do with anything, you know? <sighs> North Korea, oh my God. These claims, which Time Magazine called fanciful and implausible, were disputed by both the church and the Z Society. Yes, thank you. The New York Times remarked that the unlikely nature of the details suggested the script had been written by Mr. Warmbier's North Korean interrogators, I think. U.S. negotiator Mickey Bergman later stated that Warmbier's family were advised to maintain silence about his Jewish heritage while he was under arrest as negotiators believed that publicly repudiating Warmbier's purported affiliation with the Methodist Church would antagonize the North Korean regime. regime? I don't ever know how to say that. On March 16, 2016, a few hours after the U.S. On, after U.S. envoy Bill Richardson met in New York with two North Korean diplomats from the United Nations office to press for Warmbier's release, Warmbier was tried and convicted in North Korea's Supreme Court. He was charged with subversion under Article 60 of North Korea's Criminal Code. The court held that he had committed a crime pursuant to the U.S. government's hostile policy towards North Korea in a bid to impair the unity of its people after entering as a tourist. Evidence at his trial, which lasted one hour, included his confession, CCTV footage, fingerprint evidence, and witness testimony. The CCTV footage showed a man identified as Warmbier by his North Korean guide entering the staff-only area. On March 18th, KCNA released a brief, low-resolution video, time-stamped 1.57 a.m., showing a figure removing a poster from a wall and placing it on the floor. Warmbier indicated in his confession that he abandoned the poster after discovering it was too large to carry away. A hotel staff member told the court, when I got off work, there was nothing amiss. But when I returned, I thought someone had deliberately taken the slogan down, so I mobilized security to prevent damage to it and reported it to the authorities. Have you seen the crap that these people here in the United States do? The little innocent protester people who tear shit down and destroy it? Sorry. His confession reads as follows. I never, never should have allowed myself to be lured by the United States administration to commit a crime in this country. I wish that the United States administration never manipulated people like myself in the future to commit crimes against foreign countries. I entirely beg you, the people and the government of the DPRK, for your forgiveness. Please, I made the worst mistake of my life. This is just so sad. It's so sad that this young guy, so sad. Warmbier was sentenced to 15 years of hard labor. Human rights, Human rights Watch called the hearing a kangaroo court and described the sentencing as outrageous and shocking. U.S. State Department spokesman Mark Toner stated that it was clear that North Korea arrested American citizens for political purposes, despite its claims to the contrary. Ugh. Fred and Cindy Warmbier met with numerous Obama administration officials, including the Secretary of State John Kerry and with the Swedish, Swedish ambassador Torkel Stirnloff, who served as an interlocutor between the U.S. and North Korea. In May of 2017, Fred Warmbier said the Obama administration had encouraged them to keep a low pro profile about their son's situation but he and his wife wanted their son to be part of any negotiations between the U.S. and North Korea. On June 13, 2017, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson announced that North Korea had released Warmbier. Tillerson also announced that the State Department had secured Warmbier's release at the direction of President Donald Trump, and the State Department would continue discussing three other detained Americans with North Korea. Subsequent media reports revealed that at a meeting in New York on June 6th, North Korean officials had advised U.S. State Department Special Representative Joseph Yun 
that Warmbier had contracted a food-borne botulism shortly after his sentencing and fallen into a coma after taking a sleeping pill. A delegation headed by Yoon flew to Pyongyang to oversee Warmbier's repatriation. After 17 months in detention, Warmbier, still in a comatose state, was medically evacuated from Pyongyang Friendship Hospital to Cincinnati, arriving on the evening of June 13th. He was taken to the University of Cincinnati Medical Center, where doctors tried to determine what caused his coma and if there were signs of recovery. Warmbier's physicians at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center stated that he was in a state of unresponsive wakefulness, commonly known as persistent vegetative state. He was able to breathe on his own and blink his eyes, but otherwise showed no signs of awareness of his environment, such as understanding language, nor did he initiate any purposeful movements. Michael Flukerger, a medical director who was part of the team which took Warmbier back to the U.S., stated that Warmbier had received good medical care at the hospital in Pyongyang. Medical records from North Korea showed that Warmbier had been in this state since April of 2016, one month after his conviction. During his release, the North Koreans provided a disc containing two magnetic resonance imaging brain scans dated April and July of 2016, showing damage to his brain. According to his medical team, brain scans revealed Warmbier had suffered extensive loss of brain tissue throughout his brain, consistent with a cardiopulmonary event that caused the brain to be deprived of oxygen. Doctors said they did not know what may have caused a cardiac arrest if one had occurred, but that it could have been triggered by a respiratory arrest while a neurointensive care specialist at the hospital stated that there was no evidence indicating botulism. His doctors found no evidence of physical abuse or torture. Scans of Warmbier's neck and head were normal outside of the brain injury. They added, we didn't see any evidence of healing fractures or healed fractures that would have been within that time frame, and that we believe that for somebody who had been bedridden for more than a year, that his body was in excellent condition, that his skin was in excellent condition. Warmbier's father held a press conference on June 15th, but declined to answer a reporter's questions as to whether or not the neurological injury was caused by an assault, saying he would let the doctors make the, that determination. He stated that his family did not believe anything the North Koreans told them. He expressed anger at the North Koreans for his son's condition, saying there is no excuse for any civilized nation to have kept his condition secret and denied him top-notch medical care for so long. After his parents requested a speeding tube be removed, Warmbier died at the hospital at 2.20 p.m. on June 19th of 2017 at the age of 22. His family issued a statement expressing their sadness, thanking the hospital staff for, the act, for their actions. President Trump issued a statement regarding Warmbier's death. Quote, there is nothing more tragic for a parent than to lose a child in the prime of his life. Our thoughts and prayers are with Otto's family and friends and all who loved him. Close quote. He added, quote, the United States once again condemns the brutality of the North Korean regime, regime, regime as we mourn its latest victim. Close quote. North Korean officials said their country was the biggest victim, really, of Warmbier's death as a result of a smear campaign, stating their treatment of him was humanitarian, a spokesperson added. Although we had no reason at all to show mercy to such a criminal of the enemy, enemy state. We provided him with medical treatment and care with all the all sincerity of humanitarian bases until his return to the U.S., considering that his health got worse. At the request of Warmbier's family, an autopsy was not performed, and only a post-mortem external examination was conducted. Doctors speculated that the cause of death could have been a blood clot, pneumonia, sepsis, or kidney failure. Sleeping pills could have caused Warmbier to stop breathing if he had botulism and was paralyzed from it. The University of Cincinnati doctors found no evidence of botulism, but several neurologists said that botulism could not be ruled out given the length of time before Warmbier's return to the U.S. GQ journalist Doug Block Clark suggested that Warmbier might have attempted suicide sometime after his sentencing. The U.S. coroner who examined Warmbier's body after his death said that Warmbier's body showed not, no obvious signs of torture. Funeral for Warmbier was held on June 22, 2017 at Wyoming High School. More than 2,500 mourners attended. He was buried at Oak Hill Cemetery in Glendale, Ohio, Ohio, and students tied ribbons on every 
tree and pole along the three mile route taken from the funeral procession from the high school to the cemetery. Oh my God, this is horrible. It's just horrible, you guys. I, I can't, I can't even imagine. Okay, so several nights in a row I had a dream. It was the same exact dream. It was uh, a windowless room. Um, there was this contraption hanging from the ceiling. There was a young man attached to this contraption. At the time, I had no idea who this was. Um, Otto had not come to me at this point, so I had no idea who this was. There were four men who looked to be Asian in these uniforms. Um, the young man was strapped. There was a thing hanging from the ceiling, chained to the ceiling, and his arms were outstretched like this. He was like strapped to, it's like this, comes from down from the ceiling, it's like this metal, metal thing back here and it runs out and his arms were like strapped to it and he was like hanging there. He was crying and he was like, um, the young man was crying saying, I don't speak your language. I don't speak your language. I didn't do this. Why would I do this? I didn't, I didn't do it. I want to go home. I just want to go home. I just, please, I just want to go home. Out of the four men in uniform, one of them was clearly like in charge. I don't know if he was like the superior officer or what, I don't know. But he was clearly in charge and he was speaking in his language um, shouting screaming things at this young man the young man's crying hysterically he's like I'm in pain can you please let me down I didn't do this <sighs> okay so the man who's clearly in charge turned around and barked at this other little guy smaller man and he walked up with this box. It had a cord this way and a cord this way and these little clamps. And he walked over and clamped, clamped. Uh, he walked over and, sorry, <laughs> this is, it's hard guys. He walked over and clamped his ears. And then he went over and he like did like this and then pushed a button. And then this poor young man started like violently shaking and screaming and crying. And it was like the hardest thing to watch. He was in so much pain and it, the guy walks over and takes it off his ears. And then the young man starts yelling, I didn't do this, I didn't do this, I just wanna go home, I just want my mom and dad, I just wanna go home, I didn't do this. Guy walks back up at, after the guy barks at him, walks back up, clips it on his sleeve, right? But he clipped it, when he clipped it on the sleeve, he clearly had the young man's skin in there, if that makes any sense. Um, did it again, and the young man started shaking violently and crying, and you know, it, it was hard to watch. Then one of the other guys walked up, they unhooked the clamps, and he, on the back of these things where his arms were outstretched, there were like these metal clamp things that he undid and then the young man just fell collapsed on the ground and it was like a hard fall onto like a hard floor there was no carpeting and it was a it was pretty high right so his body like just uh. so they picked him up and they slammed him on a chair and he was kind of like falling forward, like, you know, like he was going to fall over. And they kept coming back and slamming him back on the like metal chair. Um, and he was in pain. He was clearly in pain. This poor kid was in pain. Um, 
And he was like, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Please, please just let me go home. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I'm not anybody. I'm nobody. My name. And then that's how I knew who he was. He said, my name's Otto Warmbier. I think he said his full name. And then I was like, wait, I've heard that name. And then it clicked. Um, one of the little guys walked over and like, slapped him as hard as he could and Otto fell out of his chair onto the hard floor again. Um, they came back over, they hooked the little things up to his ears again and I, I guess it's electricity, they were like electrocuting him. Um, yeah. This went on for quite a while and then they picked him up and drug him into like this little cell and they stood outside of the cell Okay, laughing at him, you know, and just making fun of him. Um, they were electrocuting him. He had soiled himself. They were making fun of him, apparently, about that, because they were, like, pointing and laughing. And it was just so disgusting. And this poor kid is just, you know, crying in pain. And he's like, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I'm not lying. I didn't do it. He kept insistent that he didn't do it. Okay. Um, at one point, the guy who was like in charge was like, I guess in his language was asking like Otto a bunch of questions and like wanting a reply. And Otto was like, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't know what you're saying. I don't understand. You know, it was bad. You guys, it, it this went on for a while. It was bad. It was bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he's in the cell, they're outside of the cell, they're taunting him, they're laughing. Well, he ended up like, just kind of like slumping forward, like passed out. And that was when I woke up. Did he die then? I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, so ultimately like the next day after I had back to back of these dreams, the next day Otto came to me, I recognized him. Um, I told him that I'd had the dreams and I, you know, I saw what happened and he talked about his family, how bad he missed them. And ironically enough, you know, they were saying that he was brain dead and that he wasn't responding to them when he got back to the US. But he said he heard everything, excuse me, everything that his family said, uh, his friends, everybody that went in that room, he heard what they said. He said he didn't feel like he could respond, like his body wasn't allowing him to respond, but he heard everything. So y'all, that's a lesson, remember that. If they tell you somebody, oh, they're in a vegetative state, they don't understand you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he talked about how, you know, he was able to hear everybody and, you know, he was trying, in his brain, he was trying so hard to, to respond and his body wasn't cooperating, I guess. So, um, yeah, so, I asked him if he would answer some questions. He said, of course. Um, I told him, first of all, I knew UVA area pretty well because my doctors are all out there and I commute there and we talked about that. And so I said, why did you take that poster down? Why, why would you do that, you know? And he said, we had been drinking, we had all been drinking. He said, I don't remember taking that poster down. He said, and I don't think it was because I blacked out. I do not remember taking that poster down. He said, when I saw the video, he said, I didn't think it was me. <laughs> he said, that wasn't me. And he said, so that compiled with the fact that he didn't remember. And he said, look, I've drank before. It's not like that was my first time drinking. He's like, and I... I never drank to the point where I blacked out and I didn't remember things like that. He's like, 
it just made no sense that I was in this area of the hotel. He said it, I, he said, he believes that he was set up. He said that from the second he was arrested, um, and what little bit he did understand with the translators, he said that he believes that he was set up. That it was an intentional setup so that North Korea would have leverage with the U.S. I said, I know the answer to this, but I want to know about the Z Society and the Methodist Church and the CIA. And he said, it was all bullshit they came up with. Which we kind of already knew that. I said, you know, I remember when you came back to the U.S. and when you passed and they said that they didn't think that you had been tormented. They didn't think that you had been beaten. Um, I, but I know what I saw, you know, I, I said, I saw, you know, I was able to see what happened to you. And he said, he said that from what he knew, uh, I guess when he was in some room, um, right before his sentencing, he was in this room and there were other, um, other people in there that had been, that were about to be convicted or had been convicted. I don't remember what he said. He said that they said, um, that he was set up. Apparently one of the people that was in there spoke Korean or understood Korean or something and said that, it was a setup. It had been a setup. That's what they led him to believe. So, you know, he said, why would this guy lie? There's no reason for him to lie. And it would make sense. You know, Kim Jong-un wanted to F with Trump to see what he could get away with. And, you know, Trump was the president at the time. He had gotten away with it, you know, when it came to Obama. They hadn't done anything. So he thought, oh, let me see if I can do it with this president. You know what I mean? Like, and this is not political, you guys. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I was pretty like, wow, because I was just under the impression that he had done it, you know, and maybe he did. I don't know. He claims he didn't. There's no reason why he would lie. Um, when I had the dream and I saw him in there, he was screaming, I didn't do it. I didn't do this. You know, he was saying, this is a mistake. I didn't do this. So that's. That's what he told me. And they did, in fact, torture him. I saw it, you know. And he said, yeah, he said, I think, that's what he said. He said, um, when I talked to the other guys in there, um, they'd all been tortured too. And he said, they obviously know what they're doing. You know, he said, they obviously know how to do it to where you can't really tell. He said, it's not like I had a bunch of broken bones or anything, you know, which, yeah. I mean, I guess if they do it all the time, I guess they've gotten good at their craft which is so effing pathetic. Um, yeah, he said, I asked him if there's anything else he wanted to add. He said he remembers that point in his life. You know, he remembers the torture and remembers the beatings. He said he was kind of in and out of things. Um, and I said, look, when I had the dream, you kind of slumped forward and fell, you know, just slumped forward and fell like you were limp. I said, is, is that when you passed away? Or when they said you became brain damaged um, or veg in a vegetative state or however they said it. I'm sorry. Um, he said, yes. He said, you know, they tortured him prior to... They tortured him prior to his case and he was tortured after his case. <laughs> and I was like, what was the point in torturing you after your case? And he said, because they could, because they could. Okay, so he said the one guard, the one that I said looked like he was in charge. He said, uh, the other guys had said that uh, they call him boss, like he's in charge, like he's the boss. And he was like, yeah, they call him boss. And I guess he's the one that carries out, like, oversees the torturing and, and all the different techniques and things that they use. And I asked him if he was um, waterboarded. I only know about that because of um, 
my husband's stepfather and what he used to do for a living. And he said, yes, I was. Yes, I was. So he said, he said, you have to remember, I was tortured over a period of time. It wasn't like, he said, when you, when you saw what was happening to me, it wasn't like that was the first time. He's like, it had happened many times. They had used many techniques. It, you guys, it was tough. Like, I don't even... He said that he remembers what he went through. But he said that was such a horrible time in his life that he tries not to think about it. Um, he said he is in a good place now. He said he misses his family and his friends terribly. Um, he said, but... You know, he said, I'd choose where I am any day over where I was. And he said, I, I'm just so grateful. And he said, he said, I'm so grateful to my parents that, you know, continue to fight for me and for the U.S. government that continue to fight for me. He said, you know, I'm so grateful. Um, he said, I wish it would have had a better outcome, you know. You guys. <laughs> it was tough to watch that. Like, I, it was really tough to watch that. Um, especially seeing it several times, like uh, it just killed me. <sighs> it did. It killed me, you guys. <laughs> okay, be nice, be kind, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, yeah, <sighs> that about does it for me. Bye, guys.